So I am here with Professor Declan Murphy. Declan is a urologist who specialises just in prostate cancer surgery. Welcome Declan. Hi Victoria, nice to be back. Yes, absolutely. So Declan, we did a video a couple of weeks back all about nerve sparing surgery. The comments we got afterwards were brilliant. Quite a few people now want to know, well, what about non-nerve sparing surgery? I think firstly, I'd love to know from you, how often in your experience do you do surgery where you cannot spare any of the nerves at all? It's not infrequent, Victoria, and one of the reasons for that is nowadays we try not to do surgery on patients unless they have clinically significant cancer, which usually means there's a reasonable amount of cancer and it's quite aggressive, which more often than not will be quite close to nerves. Uh, compared to, you know, five or ten years ago when we often operated on patients with probably insignificant cancer. We just didn't really appreciate that. And in those men, it was smaller tumors away from the nerves and we could do very aggressive preservation of those nerves. So nowadays it's not unusual, uh, probably in up to half of patients that we will not do complete nerve sparing. Um, the reason is that the nerves will be too close to the, uh, to the cancer. So non-nerve sparing is something that is a, a part of practice and it's only a reflection of the fact that we try and operate on cancers that are more significant and we therefore have to work a little harder to make sure we adequately deal with those cancers. Yes, so now what I find is when I read the literature all around erectile function after prostate cancer surgery, once you get into the frying print, they tend to have only reported on the nerve sparing patients. Yeah. If I found it personally quite difficult to get information about non-nerve sparing. Look, does it mean that there's absolutely no chance at all of any erectile function returning? I know, honestly, with some of my clients that I've seen, they've been told at one point that there's very little chance because it was unilateral or none at all. But then a few years down the line, while it's not total, they are experiencing yeah. some response. Now, What's going yeah. on there? I love your professional yeah. opinion on that. So, we, and I think um, uh, because we've had a few questions about it, we are going to make a, a short video about anatomy in, in the coming weeks. And we'll actually show you what it looks like inside. And uh, nothing too gory, but, but mm. the view we see when we're looking at the prostate and we're looking at the nerves, they run on the left side and they run on the right side. So we can show you what that looks like and what we, yes. we judge to be nerve sparing and non-nerve sparing. But in summary, briefly, the nerves that run alongside the prostate and up to the penis run on the left side of the prostate and the right side. So in the same way as we have two kidneys and two breasts and two testicles and so on, we have nerve bundles that run on the left and on the right. And when we speak about nerve sparing, it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, we are either doing bilateral, both sides full nerve preservation, or we're doing unilateral nerve preservation because the tumor is predominantly on the other side and we want to get it clear, um, or we're doing non-nerve sparing where the, the prostate's coming out without, uh, um, without preservation of any of the nerves. And then even within nerve sparing, we have grades of nerve sparing. It, it, say, for example, we're preserving the nerves on the left side. It's not an all or nothing thing. There may be cancer, uh, significant cancer on the left, but if we think that we can get safely preserve those nerves without preserving the cancer, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then we will do partial nerve sparing. So within all of that, there's a, you can tell there's, a, great, there's um, a spectrum of what is nerve preservation. But you refer to a situation where sometimes we've said to the patient, you know, you've got um, aggressive cancer, both sides, yeah. uh, bulging out through the prostate, the MRI, mm -hmm. is, everything's abnormal. Our plan is to not preserve nerves. Our plan is to take the prostate out and take yeah. the nerves with it. And, you know, it's, it's weird and it's not rare that a patient will come back two years later and say, my, my erections have come back. I had no expectation. How is that possible? Classic head how, how is that possible? And on the other hand, <laughs> yes. we, we will look down into a pelvis of a, a youngish patient with excellent erections, with bilateral preservation of the nerves, and we'll uh, look, look down uh, through the robot and say, oh, we've done a beautiful job preserving these nerve bundles. I'm sure he'll do yeah. very well. And that patient will be in the office the same day as the other guy two years later. No return of the erection. So go figure, okay? Mm. So there's clearly more to it than yeah. just anatomical preservation of the nerves. And subtleties within technique about, you know, the types of energy we use, the traction we put on the prostate and so on and so forth. We've written a lot about this, the subtleties of technique. So it's not just the physical preservation of the bundles, but small subtleties. Yeah. Um, and we've, we've done, you know, prospective studies using nerve stimulation technologies uh, to see whether that might improve nerve sparing. No, it doesn't, you know, etc. So I think it's an ongoing area where we will always have some surprising results in terms of preservation and non-preservation. Yeah. So and at this point, it really sounds like this isn't black or white. 
just being told you're not going to have your nerves preserved does not equal therefore no erections. It, it sounds like there's actually a dot dot dot, it's a bit more complicated than that. Yes. Would that be an accurate way of putting it? Yeah, it is. But, you know, a very familiar theme, Victoria, as you know, for us is, is setting um, realistic expectations Absolutely. for patients. Yeah. So I think because this is the most um, problematic area of recovery for mm -hmm. patients in our hands as well yeah. after this type of surgery is, is recovery of sexual function, we tend to set realistic expectations. So clearly, if we're not doing full preservation or if the patient is older, we know that's a thing that's a negative predictor. If you're you know, more than 70 years of age, for example, it's very difficult to recover erections, even if the nerves are beautifully preserved. Or if the erections aren't great beforehand anyways, this, this is, these are all the things we put in the mix. And we'll say to the patient, look, I think that your likelihood of recovering spontaneous erections, even one or two years later, is extremely low. And I'll usually give a figure, I'll say less than 20% or less than 10%. And then if that patient comes back a year later and two years later and says, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm having some recovery, you know, they're really, they're, they're pleased because they've exceeded the expectations that we set them. Yes. Whereas on the other hand, if you have unrealistic expectations, if you come into this and say, oh, I've sought out this particular surgeon because he or she does certain operation and he or she said to me, oh, you've got a 90% chance of getting your erections mm -hmm. back. And I've read that on the internet and blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah. And then they don't get their erections back. It's a shock to them because they had very high expectations, which perhaps were a little unrealistic. So yes. I think the theme of setting realistic expectations uh, and rolling out the best you can do, the best, high quality surgery, uh, high quality support for sexual rehabilitation uh, is what we need to do. Absolutely, it really sounds, the conclusion there is, if you're told non-nerve sparing, it's important, you might look, well keep your expectations that it's probably going to be a, a different, a longer, a very different journey to nerve sparing. But at the same time, you can never say never. And I think that is so important because if we're working with stats and likelihood, and this is how I, how I practice, it's, well, let's always just work on what can maximize your chances. Let's work with probability and keeping in mind, you know, being realistic. Well, if you didn't have great erections beforehand, there's something else that's probably contributing to erectile dysfunction. So, you know, we're working more in a negative direction, but let's always keep on what can positively move you towards the likelihood that you're looking for, which is that maximizing what the potential is. Um, would that be around Yeah, that? exactly yeah. right. And you know, I think the top line conversation that fuels all that, Victoria, is understanding uh, what it is that the, an individual patient and his loved one value the most. Absolutely. And yeah. you know, and we spoke about this in our last uh, video, I think that uh, a lot of patients really, to be honest, the majority of patients will prioritize not dying of their cancer. You know, they've been diagnosed with cancer, they're in their 60s or younger or whatever, and they're worried about that. Yeah. Okay, and it's often the dominant thing, but the, the sexual function and the urinary function, the other really two important aspects of prostate cancer treatment, uh, are really important to understand how the patient values it. And so, for example, in the two prostatectomies I did yesterday, mm -hmm. um, the first patient had had um, uh, diabetes for very many years and had lost his erections many years ago. Yeah. And four young grandkids made it extremely clear that the thing he valued the most was not dying of his prostate cancer in the next 20 or 30 years. And his erections were already very poor, but I did explain to him they will get worse. You know, he still had some tumescence, some swelling, but no, no penetration, no rigidity. So that's easy for him. He's made a very clear value judgment that what he values is not dying of his cancer. Yeah. Doesn't care about for the deterioration in poor quality erections. Does care about urinary function, and we'll talk about that mm -hmm. a different day. Sure. Whereas the second patient I operated on, 74, um, uh, good quality erections, very sexually active, very aggressive prostate cancer, uh, but only on one side of the prostate. So our agreed plan with him was we're going to do non-nerve sparing on one side. And, and we will make a video explaining a bit about the, the anatomy yeah, of that. But what I'll often say to patients is, you know, the nerves are like skin uh, attached to the prostate. Mm -hmm. So they're not like in a, a neighboring uh, village, you know. And so when we do nerve preservation, we go very close to the prostate. We size onto that skin and peel it off. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you have a big, bulky, high-grade cancer right under the skin, you know, the problem is you may well have a positive margin and leave some cancer on the nerves. We won't know it at the time. We'll know it later on. Mm -hmm. um, so on one side, non-nerve preservation. So we get a good covering on this aggressive cancer. On the other side, he had no cancer. So we do very aggressive preservation of the nerves yeah. on the side that's safe to do so. So we've done unilateral nerve sparing. Yes. What does it mean for a 75 year old with good quality erections with unilateral nerve sparing? Well, it's not as good as if it's a 50 year old with fantastic erections with bilateral nerve sparing, yeah. but at least we have left structurally some of his neurovascular bundle intact and then hopefully down the line we get, we get a good result in terms yeah. of cancer, continence and we'll see about it. So we very much 
need to tailor um, each patient the, the the level of nerve sparing depending on what their uh, values are what their goals yes. are uh, what the quality of the erections are and importantly uh, what the cancer situation is yes and that word tailoring so tailoring what can be done in terms of treatment but then also that tailoring well what are we going to do in the months and years prior you know after you've had surgery because it is a new world that most of my clients say they're suddenly forced into and so keeping in mind and deciding that and having that thought and that conversation early what are my values what what is quality of life to me because I've got a great surgeon who's going to focus on quantity and then what can we do to make sure that it's still quality afterwards and I think we spoke about this the last day but uh, mm -hmm. also when pa patients come in they've just been diagnosed with cancer they've come for a second opinion and the cancer thing is the big thing but they may be sexually active and it's been an important part of their quality of life and all the focus can be on the cancer mm -hmm. uh, but what we you know say to patients is yes probably we're going to do well with the cancer and in you know three months after surgery cancer's mm -hmm. gone and everything's going well and those comments they might have made beforehand about it's the cancer I'm worried about, uh, I accept that the erections will go. Perspective changes because now you're six months later or two years later, you're, you've realized I'm going to live for another 20 or 30 years yeah. and, and now I'm really beginning to miss those, that quality yeah. of life I had. Um, so therefore I constantly uh, recheck uh, what they said to me beforehand. Uh, in terms of their prioritization and what they value because the perspective will change as you suddenly realize oh all that concern I had when I was sitting in your office about cancer mm -hmm. is now totally gone yes I'm a year out from surgery uh, uh, my PSA is undetectable penny is dropping that you know I'm probably not gonna uh, die from prostate cancer yeah. and then the other things your values will, will may revert and you'll say gee I really am struggling now yeah. and so so that's okay so we have to constantly check in with our patients to see um, how they're feeling about that aspect yes. and then offer them appropriate support. And that's, I think, a wonderful way of putting it that if a healthcare professional is watching this, this is why it is important to constantly ask the question about sexual health, sexual well-being, not just three months, six months, but every time you see a patient off that point and to make it clear, look, it's okay for your values to switch, for your priorities to change yeah. as well. And you know, we will just always work towards what it is that your focus is at that point and what matters to you. And you know another thing that that's, I find very interesting, again listening to your patients uh, all the time, is um, a couple may sit here in their late 60s or early 70s with a wonderful relationship and say, you know, we're not sexually active, um, but he may still be enjoying erections, waking up with erections, yes. maybe enjoying masturbation, uh, enjoying uh, pornography, whatever it is, but yeah. their relationship is not built on um, penetration and, and so on that they might have enjoyed in years gone by. So they may have made a statement as a couple that that's not the most important part of their quality of life. Yeah. But for the male, for the patient, and it's true for their relationship, mm -hmm. but for the patient himself who enjoys erections and may enjoy masturbation, um, you know, three months later, six months later, he may well be suffering greatly because he's lost that quality of life, even though as a couple their relationship wasn't dependent on them being sexually active together or at least having penetrative sex, their yes. intimacy changes. And this is something you speak about all the time, this um, re-navigation uh, of intimacy and, and relationship in the absence of often rigidity and penetration. But for the male partner who may be, the, or for the couple who the rigidity and penetration is not the most important thing, I have to constantly check in with the, the man because yes. they may sit there happily saying that because they're really happy, the cancer's gone, he's continent, the grandkids are great, mm -hmm. but he's missing waking up in the morning without erection. So he yes. may benefit from a, an aggressive strategy involving you know, pumps and Viagra, but especially injections and other things we will offer patients, even though the intention is not for him to have penetrative intercourse. That's not the Absolutely important thing. Exactly. Yeah. And that's such a good point. And even just look if it's outside the sexual realm. You woke up every morning with an erection. That's a physical part of your body. Now, if you'd woken up after any surgery yeah. and they said, oh, you know, you've lost your arm, but don't worry, you don't play tennis anymore, do you? <laughs> you know, we would be doing so yeah. much in that case to yeah. address that sense of loss and to address yeah. well, what, what can be done, you know, for, it. and like you said, even if you are feeling, I don't know whether the erections are going to come back naturally, there is a lot that can be done in order for you to achieve an erection and even just to remember look down the line if you wanted to look into implant surgery 
Yeah. That is a way of having an erection pretty much whenever you want to. It is yeah. more surgery, but it's so that everybody, I think, knows, look, there are options in either direction. There's options towards maximizing your chances of natural recovery. There are options to create that rigidity and an erection when you want to. And then, then there's also options, like you said, of enjoying sexuality and pleasure without an erection. So, that's uh, great. Thank you, Declan, for this conversation. It was no wonderful. problem. I look forward to seeing what people say in the comments. Yeah. Please do comment below with further questions that you'd love to ask Declan and myself. Uh, comment as well just on how your journey is going and how you're finding it. And please like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel if you found it helpful. And we'll see you in another video soon. Thank you. Thank you, Declan.